Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight for our Women, Veterans, and the MBA panel. Um, I'm Christine Schwartz. I'm the CEO of Service to School. So before I introduce you to all the wonderful women on this panel, I want to make sure all of you attendees know about Service to School's mission. We are a veterans nonprofit and our mission is to prepare veterans and transitioning service members for their next chapter of leadership by helping them gain admission to the best college or grad school possible. So we want everyone here tonight to be inspired by these panelists who are current MBA students and made that transition from the military into an MBA program. If you're considering an MBA or another graduate degree or an undergraduate degree, I urge you to go to our website and sign up for support. We at S2S, we will pair you with a mentor and that person will be able to assist you on your journey back to higher ed. This is completely free and we provide this to veterans because we believe that you should consider and have access to a great education. I also wanna give a huge shout out to Stephanie Puzak. She is a current MBA student at Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Steph coordinated this panel and she coordinated this panel along with next week's panel, which will address um, admission specific topics. And then a panel on March 22nd, which will cover industries and careers post MBA. Now I'm excited to introduce you to all of our panelists, um, Kristen Mixon, Livia Johnson, Siobhan Huslander, and Gretchen Pace. So we will do intros and then move into some prepared questions. If during the panel you have a question, please drop it into either the Q&A box or the chat box, and we will address those after we get through all the prepared questions. Again, thank you all for being here and take it away, Kristen. Thanks, Christine. Uh, hi, everybody. So I'm Kristen Mixon. I am a second year MBA student at uh, Michigan Ross School of Business. And before business school, I was in the Army for eight years. And during that time, I was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. When I got out, I was a captain. And um, after business school, I will be working in real estate in the Detroit area. Siobhan, you want to go next? Thank you. Uh Nice to meet everyone. I'm Siobhan Huslander. I am a first year business student at the University of Texas McCombs Business School, I'm former Air Force Intelligence. I separated last summer. I'm currently concentrating in marketing uh, and I will be interning in the marketing uh, department at UPS this summer in Atlanta, Georgia, hopefully in person. Hi everyone, I'm Olivia Johnson. Uh, happy International Women's Day. I am a first year MBA student at um, UC Berkeley Haas School of Business. I was in the Coast Guard for um, almost 11 years from 2007 to 2017. I was a helicopter crew chief. Um, oh, and I'll be interning as a pro, uh, product manager this summer. Hi everyone, uh, Gretchen Pace here. Um, I'm currently a first year student at UVA Darden School of Business. Um, I served as a military intelligence officer in the army for about eight, eight and a half years prior to attending business school. And I am here to pursue entrepreneurship. Thanks everyone. And yes, happy International Women's Day. So my first question is going to address how you all really decided to go back to school and get an MBA. Um, so I think as a lot of us transition out of the military and consider options, um, you know, different careers are brought up, different pathways to those careers, but there isn't a lot of conversation on higher ed and specifically women veterans going to get an MBA. So Siobhan, I'll start with you. How did you decide to go back to school and um, get an MBA? Thank you. Uh, so I'd always planned to return to school. Uh, getting my master's degree was a personal goal of mine and I was gonna either do it in uniform or, or out. Um, and so when I made the decision to separate, ultimately then the question became, okay, what's the right program that's going to set me up for my next career and future employment? Um, I went right from high school to the academy into the military. So I never held a real job in uh, my view of it. And so I thought an MBA program would be 
the right one to give me exposure uh, to a variety of different industries, better structure, you know, two years to allow me to really explore what was out there. Uh, so that's why I chose an MBA program. And it really varies uh, very much by industry, but as I've kind of come to learn, um, MBAs are a good stepping stone uh, for people who definitely want to be in managerial positions. And so that's important to me too, having uh, the option to move into more of a leadership role in the private sector in the future. So that was how I made the decision to pursue an MBA. And then Livia, how about you? Sure. Um, I was enlisted in the military. Um, I had every intention to do 20 years and get a retirement. But I think, you know, four years in, I understood the importance of having an education, even for, um, for example, if I wanted to apply for OCS, I needed to have a bachelor's degree. So I went and got my bachelor's degree while I was still in the service um, in accounting. Um, and then I applied for OCS in conjunction to either thinking about getting out. Um, and so ultimately I decided to get out and I worked as a staff accountant. Um, like, yeah, I think right after, maybe six months after I got out and I quickly realized that, um, you know, I, I, I saw this gap in like leadership and like where I fit in the leadership and then having to start over. Um, in my career from, you know, being the bottom of the totem pole, like staff accountant. Um, and I thought an, uh, an MBA would be important for me, especially if I was to continue on as an accountant, I, you know, would need to get my CPA and have the required credits, which takes pretty much a bachelor or um, a graduate degree. So, um, so yeah, I decided to get my MBA for that reason, but I quickly realized that I do not want to be a corporate controller. So <laughs> I'm pivoting careers. Awesome, and how about you, Gretchen? Yeah, thanks. Um, there are really four main reasons why. Um, the first was that I had earned my full GI Bill. Um, so it was a great, great option for me to pursue um, as I was transitioning. The second reason was um, I spent a, a significant amount of time in the Intelligence and Security Command, and that is the essentially the Army's warfighting function um, that is, leads intelligence for the Army. Um, so there, it's a massive organization, and I really got exposed to the, to what it means to run a big organization and the complexity the complexity inherently involved in running a big organization. It's much different than running a team or a company. Um, so I wanted to understand and learn about the skills required to, to run a big organization. And I really feel like the MBA program gives you exposure to that. Um, this, the, uh, the third reason is because I really wanted to give myself some time to think and explore before jumping into my next big career. And so here at Darden, I have a lot of opportunity to get exposed to some things I didn't even know exist, existed prior to leaving the Army um, and just give myself time and space before um, I jump into that next big job. And then the final reason is because I was able to do um, a veteran integration program on Wall Street and work for Bank of America for, um, for about a month and a half. And in doing that, I realized that I really did want to explore entrepreneurship. And I, I didn't necessarily want to go work for a big, big corporation. So going to Darden really allowed me to kind of open that door and give myself time to explore entrepreneurship before I'm running my own company. Great. And then you, Kristen. Yeah, I feel like um, I have a lot of similarities with a lot of the reasons other people decided to choose an MBA before getting out into the real world. But I think one thing, um, you know, my husband and I are both dual military. We're both in business school right now. So that's something I didn't say in my intro. But I think one thing we both learned in the military was that in order to effectively lead, you have to know a little bit about all the different things that people you're working with do and where to go for subject matter expertise. And we felt that an MBA was a great way to understand what all the different functions were of different business areas so that we could effectively lead once we're in the organizations we'll finally be in. And I think another part that I didn't realize at the time that is just a fruit of coming to an MBA program that is a benefit is that, um, you know, we have a lot of intangible skills that we've built through our experiences in the military. And a lot of the technical skills, that's where I, at least I felt I had some gaps. And through the different, you know, action-based learning things we have in business school and internships, you're able to kind of draw some parallels and commonalities and some functions you used to do 
in the military and, and it's just called something different in the corporate world. And you kind of can see those parallels and be like, build some confidence and like, okay, I do have these skills. It just is called something else. And so it was a really, really, um, you know, great decision for both of us. Awesome. Yeah, that reminds me of, you know, the decision-making process we all learn in the military. I'm sh they all use it in corporate America. It's just called something different. Um, okay, so on to a little tactical question. Um, what resources did you use to apply to school? So perhaps what resources did you use during that application or maybe when you were considering where to apply? So I will have Livia start. Thank you. Yeah, um, first, the GMAT GRE is very difficult if you guys haven't taken it yet. Um, I would suggest buying some books and starting early as giving yourself as much time. Um, I went to prep um, classes at Kaplan and I think that was imperative for my success um, with the GRE and GMAT. Um, additionally, I talked to a lot of other MBAs um, that I know just to pick their brains and see, you know, like how useful it was for them. And then when I was ready to apply, I reached out to the school's Veterans Club, which was also foundational for my success and during my application. Yes, test prep is huge. Um, how about you, Gretchen? Yeah, um, so in, in addition to the test prep, that was probably the biggest hurdle. I, I did an in-person class and then online um, test preparation. Um, but I also attended some MBA events that Darden was hosting. I was all in on Darden from the start, so I knew exactly where I wanted to go. Um, so their admissions portal has um, events all the time that you can attend. And right now it's very easy because it's all virtual. Um, but I went to a few in-person events. Um, I also went to a Forte MBA program event for women um, hosted in DC. And so that was great to just meet uh, admissions personnel and see various schools. But again, I was pretty set on Darden. Um, and then I also um, connected with some uh, military first years at Darden um, who kind of put me in touch with the right um, admissions people to talk to. And so that was really helpful is, is reaching out using your military uh, network and finding people who are in the school that you want to go to and connect with them and have them put you in touch with other people, especially the admissions people who matter the most. Yeah, so can I, I ask how you found those people? Did you find them on LinkedIn and just kind of send them a cold note or these personal contacts? So um, it was personal contacts, so friends of friends. So um, it was actually my husband who, same, same thing with Kristen, he's also first year at Darden. Um, one of his buddies from West Point had a good friend who was at Darden. And so he put us in touch with him. We got to know him. And then um, through him, we met the, the military, the admissions lady who, who deals with the military uh, candidates. Okay, great. Um, Kristen, how about you? Resources, and I know Gretchen mentioned online, um, kind of these info sessions, and especially this year, you know, there are so many virtual info sessions. Did you attend anything like that? Did you find it helpful? I would love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, so for test prep, I used an app called, um, a program called Magoosh, M-A-G-O-O-S-H, and um, I really liked that because there were videos. Um, I was, quant was challenging for me. So they had videos and you could follow had an instructor step by step. You could take practice exams and they had apps, which are, were also really helpful for me. My husband was deployed and I was a company commander and I have two children. So when I was applying to business school, I had to like really plan out my time. And I ended up going to the Starbucks near my office between PT and work and studying for an hour a day. And that's, that's how I did that prep. Um, and it was helpful. It helped me improve my score a lot. In terms of um, in-person events or just virtual events, I definitely echo that you should go to them. Um, I was also all in on Ross, but you know the way that I interacted with current students was going to their military preview weekend, which they normally host over um, around Veterans Day weekend. And when we went, it was in person and it was a great event and we got to meet veterans in the program. As soon as we signed up, they proactively reached out to us. So, you know, that was how we got connected. And then we ended up, you know, having classmates and friends that were going there in years following that. So um, we had some of our own network that we leveraged, but um, the in-person events are great. I definitely believe you should go because those are all touch points and every touch point with admissions or current students is, is a, you know, 
a point in your corner for getting into schools. Um, but what it did we did this year was there was was virtual programming, um, which we did the same thing. We had another military preview weekend this year, and it was well attended. And current students to make themselves very available, and as well as partners and family members to talk about the whole experience. And then the only other thing is we also have a podcast at our school. And so that was another thing I did was I would listen to podcasts because I would sometimes they would share admissions tips and they'd also share some stories about the different you know student experiences. And that helped me kind of gauge what they were looking for in admissions, but also kind of understand the culture and um, what would made Ross unique. Awesome. And then Siobhan, how about you? Resources or events, test prep, anything like that? Yep, uh, much of the same. And I think the only thing to add is that uh, about a year prior to separation, before I picked schools, I actually attended a career fair um, up in uh, Washington, DC. And that was great because there were a ton of business schools there. And that exposure helped me really think about the questions uh, that were important to me when I started looking at business schools. Because beginning out, I wasn't even sure what the important things were to ask. Uh, but the more I engaged with different schools and they highlighted what was important to them, I could start to figure out what was the best fit for me and which I was going to pursue. Um, and then once I was also kind of set on Texas, then I really used the Student Veteran Club. Um, a lot more direct phone calls, though they too do virtual open houses. Um, but reaching out and talking to people directly was probably the biggest thing that sold me on the school. Um, and then UT's website for applications and whatnot is, is very straightforward. I you know, could just leverage what the website presented and it wasn't really a mystery. Um, I contacted the Veteran Services Office directly and they were very helpful. Uh, so it was easy to do, feel like I was point to point with UT and was able to fill out the application without a, a lot of heartache. Very cool. Yeah, that's that's a good tip with knowing what knowing what to ask. Um, I, I think that's that's a hard thing to figure out when you've never had to ask these sort of employment related questions when you've been in the military. Um, I also think it's real. I just realized you all are in totally different parts of the country. So we're, we're, we're hitting all the areas of MBA programs. We have California, Texas, Virginia, and Michigan. So very cool. Um, so the next question, which I'll pitch to Gretchen first is how did you tell your story as a woman veteran? And this goes to, you know, really as part of your application process. So if it was in a personal statement, if it was during your interview, did it come up? Um, yeah, how, how did you tell your, your story of being in the military? Yeah, um, thanks, Christine. Um, so this is one, one point I really like to talk with people um, who are trying to figure out how they tell their story. Because um, I would say when I went through the admissions process to Darden, I didn't do it well because I didn't know really what people meant when they said, tell your story. And so, um, I did well enough, obviously, to get into Darden, but when I told my story during the in-person interview process, I kind of went chronologically through my resume and just listed, you know, job by job what I had done. And that's not necessarily helpful because they've already seen your resume and they, they know what it is. So I learned how to tell my story when I was preparing to do the internship for Bank of America. And I was fortunate to have great, great um, mentors help me prepare for that. And the big thing when you tell your story is you need to think about one, who your audience is, and two, what your audience is looking for in candidates. So here your audience is uh, NBA admissions personnel. And what are they looking for? They're looking for people who are going to um, build their brand and they're looking for people who are going to improve their stats. And they're looking for people who are ultimately going to be good members uh, of their community moving forward. And so when you think about you know, how you're framing your story for your audience in particular, think about what attributes align to the to their goal. So you think of three attributes that you you do very well. And then you think about three really interesting kind of funny memorable stories where you have displayed that attribute. So for example, um, one of the attributes I wanted to showcase um, was the fact that I was good at connecting people to a, a accomplish a common goal. And so I told a deployment story where a general looked at me and said, hey, you got 20 minutes, come up with NAIs for the entire country of Afghanistan. Um, and we're gonna move all the special operations assets to those NAIs that you come up with. 
and I hadn't been in Afghanistan for that long. I looked to my right and I'm like, is this guy really talking to me? And I'm like, yes, sir, I'll do it. Um, so I go downstairs and I just call all the people that I know and bring all the resources together and come up with great NAIs and we end up uh, accomplishing the mission. But the way I told the story um, was really memorable and I really connected with, with the audience. And um, it, it's much better than just going through bullet point by bullet point for what your resume is. They already have that, they already know. They want to remember who you are and they want to know what you think you bring to the table. Awesome. This, yeah, very good, very good tips. The rule, your rule of three, Gretchen's rule of three. Um, Kristen, how about you? Yeah, so I think that um, Gretchen kind of touched on this, but I think that, you know, your application, it's all a different, everything in your application has a different purpose. So your resume is a list of all the things you've done. And then each essay, you need to highlight something different with each essay. So like for Ross, we had three essays. We had two short essays and you had one longer essay. Um, and so like, you know, ha be strategic. Don't, don't hit on the same thing in every single one. Pick different things that you wanna highlight um, and really like dig two levels down. Like if you say like, I wanna work, if I wanna be part of the revitalization of Detroit, say why, like say who are the people that ultimately you are reaching by doing that job in five to 10 years. So just think like two levels of, like deeper than the surface of what 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 is you want to do and why you want to do it. And I think that because the purpose of those essays is to really show who you are and what you value because a resume can't do that. Okay, so that's what I think the essays are for. Um, and then I think in terms of um, how you tell your story, you know, in an interview, you're going to be asked about, tell me about a time when, you know, something happened, like you, you failed. Or tell me about a time when you had feedback that was difficult to take. Those are questions I got in my interview. And so the point of those questions, I think, is to talk about what happened, what you did in the situation, what you learned, and how the things you learned impact what you do now. And I think that reflecting, it's important, I think, just to reflect. And I think maybe as women veterans, we probably do that a lot. I think I like overthought every single thing I went through uh, in my life. And so I think taking that time to reflect on things beforehand is, is a great exercise, um, just personally. And then before you prep for an interview, it's excellent. The other th last thing I will say about the interviews is that you're gonna have to translate, you're gonna find yourself translating what things are when you're speaking to, to people that are interviewing you because they're not gonna understand what the motor pool is or you know leading a convoy. And you're gonna find yourself like, what is a first, like defining what a first sergeant is to the person you're trying to explain the story to. And so try to think through those things ahead of time. And tr just so you don't like, it just flows a little easier and say, well, this is kind of like my right hand man and this was going on. And so try to think of just how to translate those little nuances ahead of time, if you can. And if not, I mean, I think that it'll come through. It just might take a little bit longer to get to the point of uh, the story and the learning and the impact of what you do now with that, with that experience. Thank you. Um, Siobhan, how about you? Telling telling your story, how did that go? Uh, for me, I did a lot of uh, working to connect how uh, the skills I had developed in the Air Force were going to be relevant to where I wanted to go in the future. Um, and just like uh, these ladies have said, it's when it comes to the application piece specifically, so many programs are looking for fit. Um, as a veteran, your resume is going to be, you know, enough of a differentiator because so few people serve in the military. Um, so when you're applying, it's a chance to show some personality and show how the school that you're going for is the right place to help you achieve what you want to do in the future. Uh, so for me, I talked a lot about, you know, not just uh, that, well, I have a lot of experience, you know, crunching data and making PowerPoint slides. The story that I sought to tell was that I love discoveries. I love using information to help people realize, you know, uh, strategic end goals and moving an organization towards there. Um, so being able to, to showcase those big skills and why it motivates you and how you're gonna develop those skill sets even more at the school you're going to um, and why you'd be a great member of the community is very much uh, an important piece of the school that you're looking at. And every school has such a distinct personality um, just doing the research to know what programs you'll be able to talk to and all those various components of your application is what will make you successful in that regard. Great. And Livia, for, for you, how about you telling your story? Yeah, I think it's um, 
everyone kind of touched on the important stuff. Um, one thing that I'll add is using your application to what Kristen said is using your application strategically. So for example, your resume is only supposed to be a page long and you can't fit an entire career into a one page. And so at least specifically for Haas, um, during your application, there's a work experience tab where that's a great place for you to add additional things that you didn't put in your resume in that tab. Um, specifically, I think military awards are a good one. Um, my school um, did not have a place where I can just put awards in. And so I used my work experience to highlight those awards. Um, Secondly, I think preparing for your interview is very important. I have this book, it's um, top 20 interview questions, and it shows you how to do it in a star model. I think it's pretty useful um, for preparation. I can put it in the chat once I'm done speaking. And then lastly, I think, um, you know, know the school that you're going to and the reasons why you wanna go there, do your homework. Um, for me specifically at Haas, um, they're very, keen on their defining principles, which is beyond yourself, confidence without attitude, student always, and question the status quo. And so I found ways to um, talk about how I exemplify those defining principles without actually like saying it and highlighting it. Um, because, you know, obviously this is, this is how we do business. And so like when you implement those into your answers for your interview and into your application, they can they can recognize it and say, oh, you know, Livia has done this and this to be beyond herself. She definitely belongs here. Um, and so that's what I did a lot of homework. Awesome. Also great, great tips. So as far as I'll just say women in general, <laughs> not women veterans, but you know, women often are super busy and wear many hats. You, you could be a spouse, a mom, have a full-time job. Moonlight as a yoga instructor, volunteer, you know, there's, there always seems to be a lot on our plates and a lot going on. So with that in mind, um, how do you, how do you balance everything? How do you balance a personal life, um, an MBA, getting the classes done, looking for your internship, looking for that, that job? Um, how's it going balancing it? And, you know, what are your, your, your hot tips there? So I'll, I'll start with Siobhan. For me, um, you know, I'm a full-time, I'm in the full-time program, as you know, we all are, but, um, and I'm, you know, not working um, on the side. I'm very lucky to have 100% of the GI Bill so I really can just focus and it's just school for me right now. Um, but there's a lot of different opportunities that you will have and cutting through all of the fun, exciting things that can be distractors uh, has really been key. So I'd say balancing everything just comes down to ruthless prioritization. Um, and that starts with what are your goals and then what are those things you have to do in order to achieve those. Um, so for me, because I'm trying to, to pivot into to marketing. Um, I wanted to take advantage of some of the specialty offerings that UT has from a marketing fellows program, et cetera. Uh, so making sure that I set aside the time to put those applications together, talk to the students who are in them, um, attending different uh, camps and seminars on the marketing field. Those were all things that, okay, when I have the opportunity to do them, I absolutely will. And then, it would flex sometimes because then it, you're in your core classes for your first year and you need to make sure you have a GPA that allows you to stay in the school. Um, so sometimes one priority will surge over another and just realizing again, what are those non-negotiable things that you need to do and want to accomplish? Uh, and then just realizing there are gonna be trade-offs throughout um, your entire experience. Uh, so that was how I attempted to achieve some balance, but it's a constant work in progress, um, just like any full-time job or endeavor really is. Great, yeah, I like ruthless prioritization. I should remember that on my weekends. <laughs> um, Livia, how about you with balancing it? How is that going and, and what, are, what are some things that you do? Yeah, I think for us, we already have the gift of prioritization and, um, I think being in the military and being punctual and all those good soft skills that we learned from the military. 
So I think it would be good there. Um, I think for me, academics kind of hit me in the face for the first semester. Um, you kind of feel like you're drowning and you never have enough time in a day to learn everything that you're learning and get good grades and all that. Um, I think for me, it was important to let go of being perfect. I, in the military, especially as women, we work harder. We want to make sure that we're prepared. We want to make sure that we don't fall short in any way. Um, and I think you'll quickly learn that in your MBA, um, you will. <laughs> um, you know, I got like one B and I almost had um, an aneurysm. So, um, because that's just not, um, it's just not the way that I've operated to, to get to where I am and then to be here um, and then, you know, get a B kind of sounds like I'm, I'm, uh, um, you know, like not able to, uh, to handle failure, but like, it really is that like, you need to be able to experience some letdowns um, with like job interviews and all that. And so for that, I think it's important to rely on your classmates. Um, you'll probably have study teams. And so like rely on each other. And then um, the other thing for me is like, I'm pretty independent from my husband. And so to ask for help, sorry, you know, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, my Apple watch, sorry about that. Um, and so like to have to ask for help or like ask my husband to make dinner um, and all those things, um, you know, you just, you just have to make sure that your partner is willing to support you. Um, and yeah. Awesome. I appreciate that. I'm, I know I'm bad at asking anybody for help. I think that's just a normal thing, especially women do. We just, we want to do it all and we can do it all. So we try to do it all, but sometimes you got to lean on other people. Um, Gretchen, how about you as, as far as you know, not just prioritizing, but making it balance and making it all work. Yeah, um, Livia hit spot on on a lot of um, a lot of things that I've learned since being in business school. So, before coming to business school, I definitely underestimated um, how busy we were going to be. I thought it was going to be a breeze based off you know my experience in the military. Um, and I got here, and I quickly realized you can get distracted really quickly. So you. Um, you need to remember why you came to business school in the first place. Um, so for me, I came to business school to learn new skills, especially quant-based skills. And I came to give myself the space and time to think about what I really wanted to do with the rest of my life and, and that being entrepreneurship. Um, so with those two priorities in mind, um, I try my hardest to, to learn in class and not get distracted with other things while, while I have the time to, to learn these skills. Um, and fortunately for me, I, I wasn't heavily involved in recruiting um, because I'm pursuing entrepreneurship. So that gave me more time to focus where others who are working on recruiting um, were very distracted, I, I would say at times from the course course materials. Um, and then the second piece is there, there are a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities at Darden. And so I focus on those. And what I don't focus on is running for leadership positions. Um, I, I feel like that is a strength I got from the military and that isn't something I need to focus on now. Um, and then the last thing is just really re building strong relationships. I mean, that that's the third pillar of why you go to business school is a network piece. Um, so for me, yeah, it's, the, it's the, the academics, learning new skills, it's pivoting to a new career and then it's building your network. And with that, like Livia said, you, you have to rely on other people. Other people come from different industries and they have much stronger skills than I possess in certain areas. And so there's no harm in learning from them and, and relying on them because they're gonna need your help as well with certain things. So um, yeah, with that in mind, I think um, I've been able to, to manage Darden very well, um, but I did definitely underestimate the, the amount of, of um, time I'd be spending on, on certain endeavors, but it's been a very like beneficial, um, beneficial journey. And I would also say though, that the emotional stress is far less because this is far more of, of an individual sport than the military was. So you're not taking care of other people 24 seven. Um, my last job in the military was, a com was being a company commander. So that, that is different, I would say. Great, that's, that's really insightful. And then Kristen, um, how about you? Yeah, so um, like everyone said, there's a ton going on. There's social 
there's social things going on. You can volunteer for leadership roles in different organizations. You might want to join different organizations. There's conferences, there's academics. And then I had to balance my marriage and my children as well throughout all of that. And, you know, you would think like, oh, you've gone through deployments, you've been in the military, you've moved a bunch of times. This is not gonna be a problem. Well, we have to have um, meetings to go over our calendars. We have to share our calendars. Before we pick classes, we always have to get together and huddle and say, okay, do we have coverage for a child, like picking up and dropping off kids? If we both take a night class, like what does that look like? So we have to, we have to communicate directly on what we need and what we can support and cannot support. Um, and then we also have to know, we have to communicate frequently so that we have good expectation management. So like I have to, I'm taking six classes right now. My husband's taking two. Um, and I was recruiting recently and he had finished recruiting in November. And I was like, Russ, like, I'm going to have to block, like on Fridays, I have to say, Russ, on Sunday, I need 12 to three to work on this. And then I have a meeting and I had to ask for that time. And I had to like, you know, we're a team. So I have to communicate that I need that. And I have to get his support. And then if he says, Kristen, I can't support that. Like I can't, it's too much. Then I have to like, okay, I got to go to my group and say, Hey group, like I need to move the time. I need to like, you know, so you have to you have to communicate. You got to set expectations and communicate directly with what you need. And I mean, we're all there. And I know I've been on teams where I've had to pick up the slack for others. And it's hard to admit like when you need help and need to move something to benefit only you. And I struggle with doing that, but that's something I've, I've had to do to make my relationship and work and be a good parent. And, uh, you know, I recently, Russ and I, and this doesn't end like at beginning of business school, you like figure it out in the first few months and it's over. Like I'm almost done. And we just had to have a meeting like two weeks ago to say, Russ had to say, Kristen, I need you to block off 345 to eight because that's family time. And I need you to protect that time and don't schedule any more meetings or volunteer for anything. And I had to say, okay, gotcha. So I think expectation management and communicating frequently and directly is really important for balancing everything. Awesome. I, I appreciate your family sync meetings. <laughs> we'll see us in the hallways uh and they're like it's like it's like three o'clock and they're like what do you guys and, you know my russ this happened once russ and the guy another veteran were talking and he's single and uh i come up and i'm like hey russ you getting the kids i have this i really want to work out and then take a shower and ugh. and he was just like uh i'm just gonna go home and like make dinner <laughs> and so it was just like a glimpse of like every touch point we have to be like somewhat productive at least to make it successful. <laughs> but all those people have the utmost respect for you, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, we were, we're going to talk a little bit about imposter syndrome, um, which is really, it's defined as doubting your abilities or, um, you know, feeling like you don't belong or like you're a, f a fraud. Um, and that's oftentimes that something that veterans feel in general as they enter higher education as they enter their first job. Um, but as a, as a woman veteran, is this something that you felt as you started your MBA program? Is it something you still, still feel today? Um, I would love if you all could touch on that a, a little bit. So I'll start with Livia. Uh, sure. Um, imposter syndrome is real. I will say that. I think I started um, experiencing that in the military. Um, you know, I think at most of my units, I was the only woman in my position as a crew chief. And so for that reason, I was always challenged. And then always so I think it kind of like gaslights a little bit of that imposter syndrome already. Um, and then coming out of the military, especially getting accepted here at Berkeley. I, you know, I, I got my bachelor's degree online at Ashford University. And so I was like, there's no way I'll even get accepted at Berkeley. Um, I sort of applied because um, I think that it's important to, I think MBAs in particular is the type of degree where Unfortunately, um, the school that you go to kind of matters, um, kind of sounds snooty, but it's just true. Um, and so I think it was important for me to either get into Berkeley or Stanford. Um, I also applied at University of San Francisco, which is a Jesuit school here in San Francisco. Um, so I applied for those three. And um, once I got accepted, 
it was difficult for me to accept that I belonged here, um, especially during orientation week where like most of the students had come from either Berkeley or, you know, other Ivy League schools. Um, it was scary for me, especially, uh, and even when I was applying, I came to the Veterans um, Day at Haas and like most of the people in the Veterans Club were white men that went to service academies and that was just not me. And so I didn't feel like I belonged here either for that reason. Um, but you do, I think that it's important for everyone to remember that, you know, you do belong here no matter what your background is. Like I said, I'm, I'm an enlisted, you know, immigrant from Brazil with an online degree and I did it. Um, so I think it's important for all of you to understand that. And lastly, like when you go to class, um, people that graduated from Princeton have the same questions that you have <laughs> when it comes to accounting, finance, um, operations, they'll have the same questions you have. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I still battle imposter syndrome every single day, but, um, but you know, a lot of times I try to remind myself that I belong here too. Absolutely, thank you. Um, yeah, I think like you said, everybody, everybody feels it, but um, your, your story being enlisted and the online degree and coming from just a, a different background than that typical, hey, I, I went to West Point, I went to Annapolis, and so my path is to clearly go get an MBA is um, it's kind of a, a detriment to our, our psyche in a way. So keeping yourself motivated and knowing that you do belong there is super important. Um, Gretchen, how about you? Is that something that you struggled with um, or currently struggle with it? So I wouldn't say that I struggle with wondering whether or not I belong here um, because I do know what my strengths and weaknesses are. Um, but I, I definitely feel constantly intimidated um, in some of the classes that, that I'm weaker in. So especially the quant based classes, like unfortunately I just, I'm not, I don't have a strong background in that. So I have to work twice as, as hard as everyone else um, I feel. Um, but I also know a lot of other people here at Darden, whether they're military or not, whatever background they came from, they all feel intimidated. And a lot of people do feel like they, they have imposter syndrome. Um, so it's common amongst the entire community. It's not just, um, I wouldn't say it's just a, a thing that veterans feel. Um, so I think if, if you just go in knowing, okay, these are the things that I accomplished in the military. These are the, the strengths I, I bring to the table and the admissions program, know they know what my strengths and, and weaknesses are. And they brought me here for a reason because I'm going to balance out the people who've spent their entire career working in Excel in a basement and not communicating with people. Like you, you as a veteran help that person grow in the same way they help you grow to understand how to use Excel and, and um, calculate all these complex things and, and understand, you know, what weighted average cost of capital is and, and finance and all these crazy things that um, you have to learn very fast. Um, I would say the hardest part for me and the most stressful part for me was um, at, at Darden, we have learning teams. And so every person is assigned a case to learn and do and then teach five other people. And so me, you know, being a little bit older than most people here, I just turned 32. I think the average age, age is about 27. And then being at the top of my game when I game when I was in the military, um, and then coming here and then having to teach people who are not only younger than me but much smarter than me on a lot of quant based things, um, teaching them skills that I haven't fully grasped myself was like it was just very intimidating. It was uncomfortable, but it was a great learning opportunity to just. I kind of admit that you're not perfect at everything and that everyone has room for growth. It just depend, It just varies based off um, what areas you need to grow in. So everyone here has strengths and weaknesses um, and uh, you should never feel like you don't belong because you got chosen for a reason. Awesome. Yes, admissions, obviously, you know, these schools want you. That's why, that's why you're there. I think sometimes we all lose sight of that. Like we, we don't trust we don't trust ourselves and enough to believe that they, they want you there and that is why you're there. Um, Kristen, how about you? Yeah, so I think I've um, had imposter syndrome probably a long time. I just didn't know what it was called. Um, and, um, but, but I feel like it's interesting. It's kind of like an oxymoron because I feel like, you know, when I applied to West Point, like a lot of people were like, Kristen, you're not going to get into West Point. And I was like, okay, but I'm going to try. And I'm, you know, I'm going to try. 
and uh, Kristen, you're not gonna get aviation because I had a low class rank. Um, and Kristen, your undergrad GPA wasn't great. You majored in psychology, like Michigan, uh, you have a, don't have a great GRE score. Like maybe you're not gonna get into Michigan on paper. But inherently I was kind of like, yeah, but I'm gonna still try because I think I deserve to be there. And internally, I, I thought that I think at somewhere somewhere I did, um, and I believe that it left any at least enough to make them tell me no. That's something I I think I figured out was that you know a lot of people will count themselves out because they'll tell themselves no. Um, and I think when I was in college and I was applying to go aviation, I was like I'm gonna make them tell me no. I'm gonna do everything I have to do, and if they decide I don't deserve to be here, then they decide it. But I'm not gonna decide that for myself. And that doesn't mean I still don't feel, I still feel imposter syndrome all the time. I just had an episode of imposter syndrome a few weeks ago and I was applying to jobs and um, I had a mentor and she was like, Kristen, this is ridiculous. And I was like, okay, but she had me do, but you know, it's, it's a warranted feeling. And in that moment, when you don't feel like you're in a position of power, it's very easy to feel that way. And I totally, it happens to me all the time and it's totally warranted because it's easy to be on the other end of something that you've already succeeded at and know you can succeed it's not easy when you're sitting there looking at things and you don't think you have a lot of options and knowing you're going to succeed and the thing she had me do was she um she had me make a list of the top 10 skills I thought I had from the military and write about the experience that gave me that skill and then in another column write how that skill applied how I thought that skill applied to working in real estate development which is what I wanted to do and so I took like a week and I did the reflection and I did that. And it was really empowering because I was like, wait a second, I've done all these things. And another thing she asked me, which is like, Kristen, would you change anything you've done to get to this point? And I was like, no, I would not because I'm, I am who I am because I've gone through all those experiences. Um, and so that was a great, like, a, like a come, like a just Kristen wake up, you know, you deserve to be here. You have great skills. These things apply and you're, you would add value to any organization that you are a part of someday. And so that was a great exercise. I was just like talking to your mom and they're like, you're having a pity party and you're like, they're just like snap out of it. Uh, and so I'm glad she did that for me. And um, you should do that for yourself if you're having imposter syndrome because it happens all the time. It's going to just creep back up in there whenever you think, you know, you've had, you've gotten over it. It's still going to come back. So I think that's a great thing to do every once in a while, just to pump yourself up and remind yourself why you deserve to be where you're at. Awesome. Yeah, I love, don't don't tell yourself no, have, have somebody else tell you no for sure. Um, and Siobhan, how about you? Is that something that you struggled with or currently do? Or what about looking for your, uh, an internship or a job? Was Did it creep in there? Maybe more so than the admissions process? Would love your view there. Yeah, the, um... The idea that there is a different experience between applying for an MBA program and then the, the job um, or internship application, uh, definitely a different experience because I felt like the MBA application, maybe just because I personally had such a short time window, I just did what I could and if it was going to work out, it would um, and it did very nicely. But the internship uh, search and application process was much longer. Um, looking at a ton of different companies, doing a ton of different interviews. You know, it took so long that it definitely was like, gosh, what is going on? Um, it, might have, it might just be out, you know, or misplaced confidence. Um, I certainly wondered what I was missing or, or not, you know, and effectively communicating in my interviews. And as long as uh, it was and frustrating as it was, I always viewed it as something that, you know, no, I know I have the skills to be successful. I just need to change my tactics when it comes to talking to these companies. It, I was certain it was just a communication uh, sort of deal. Um, so I think in terms of imposter syndrome, I don't think I've uh, been impacted by it too, too much. I've never felt like I didn't belong at UT or in an M MBA program. Part of that is because I was, you know, very specific about the, the kind of school I wanted to go to. And NUT is kind of known for being really friendly and collaborative, you know, not too many sharp elbows. Um, so I think that definitely made a difference for my experience. And while I've had moments where I absolutely doubted my higher math skills, um, again, I, I was able to kind of do a reality check and understand that, you know, my skills are one thing and they are not a direct reflection of my personal sense of self-worth or my potential for the future. Um, 
So for me, remembering that this is a learning environment, um, I think helped me keep my sanity a little bit because this is, that's why everybody's here. Um, like, like it's been said, everyone comes back to an MBA program because they have a knowledge gap or an experience gap that they're looking to fill. Um, so knowing what you're here after helps kind of maintain uh, that perspective. It's a challenge still, but um, yeah, it, it's really helped me to just remember like, I'm here to learn and it's okay if there are things I don't know, I will get there. Yeah, I just wanted to add a few things um, that was good for me to realize. Um, I thought that when people apply to MBAs, they had to have their stuff together, you know, their whole life figured out. Um, and that's not the case. I think that, you know, I went to like an MBA event and the Dean of Haas actually back then, um, Morgan, she, she was like, no, like you've come to an MBA to learn. If you already knew everything, you wouldn't need this degree. Um, and so realize that and also know that if you have some sticking points, um, I think Kristen, I think everybody touched upon this. Like if your GRE is not that much, it's pretty average. Or if you had, you know, a bad undergrad GPA, like apply still because being in the military is a huge deal for civilians. Like for example, I find that my civilian classmates have a hard time being punctual. <laughs> and it's just like, oh my God, that's like basic day one. Um, and so, schools know how to recognize the soft skills that you already bring. And so don't sell yourself short. Um, like I said, I never thought I would be at a, you know, top 10 business school, but here I am with every flaw that I thought that I had, you know, having an online education and all of these things. And so please don't sell yourself short, apply for the schools anyways. And like Kristen said, make them tell you no. And then as far as um, recruiting for your internship, I think it's important to remember that companies that value you will offer you a position. You know, I think I've been, I probably applied for, you know, like 20 or 30 places and have rejections left and right. Um, and I thought that, oh my God, I'm at Berkeley. All these doors are going to be wide open for me to just bust through. And that's not the case. And it's pretty demoralizing. However, the companies that did make an offer for me, I could distinctly tell that they valued my resume and everything that I brought to the company, whereas other companies where I got a rejection felt like as though they were doing me a favor by, you know, even interviewing me. So. Wow. That's interesting. Um, and yeah, good to, good to keep in the forefront of your mind too. I, yeah. Interviewing goes both ways, right? You, you also, you also want to feel wanted and like you're bringing value to the company. Um, so super important. Um, so you all are at, you know, the best MBA programs in the country would love to hear, and not necessarily as a, as a woman, but as a veteran, what has your experience been like your specifically your veteran experience been like at those schools? Um, are you doing anything with a veterans program? Um, are you involved in that kind of community? Are people looking at you for different support because they know you're a veteran uh, would love you all just to touch on what your experience as a veteran at your specific MBA program has been like. So I'll start with you, Gretchen. Yeah, um, at UVA Darden, I, it's been absolutely incredible. Um, I've kind of been in awe of the, the support that students and faculty give to military. Um, so um, on Veterans Day, I was just, I was shocked. Um, I got cards from fellow students um, and from the Dean and like gift ba baskets to just thank us for our, our service. Um, my classmates started, they um, raised a bunch of money for a veteran related charity and everyone put um, veteran related backgrounds on, on their Zoom. Um, and I really do feel that people respect my, my service. Um, they, they look to me for, for some of those soft skills that I bring and the experience I bring and um, I never feel like I'm treated differently because because I served and didn't come from the from the the corporate world um, in a bad way. I I'm, I never feel like I'm treated differently in a bad way. Um, and lastly, here we have the Darden Military Association, and it's very strong. And we have 
you know, all the veterans participate and it's a great way to just keep that connection with, with service members and feel that camaraderie. Um, so I'd say as a whole, it's been, it's been um, exceptional. And I've been surprised by the level of support because when, when I was active duty, it was just, um, we were all active duty, right? And so no one's thanking you for your service on a, on a regular basis, but here it's just, it's been, it's been awesome. Great. And then Kristen, how about you at Ross? Yeah, so um, Russ and I decided to come to Ross because we attended the military preview weekend and they had an event there, it's called VEDEX. And it's when um, I think three to five students that are veterans get up and tell a story about when they were in service. And they were very, you know, that was what the first thing we really saw. And we went to that and it was um, standing room only, like the entire, the, the, the auditorium was not big enough and they had to move it to a bigger auditorium. And I mean, this is a, this is a Thursday night um, after hours and, and everybody was there and you could hear a pin drop while people were sharing their experiences. Um, and so I just, I think in that moment, I was so impressed by the veterans that spoke for one. I was also really impressed by the student and faculty that showed up to support them during that moment. And, um, so I think, you know, from that point, I, I knew it was a great program that supported veterans. And I personally have always felt extremely respected and valued by my classmates and um, and my professors and everybody here at, at Ross. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that we bring is like in class, I mean, we think of things differently. You know, we haven't seen all these things. And so we kind of bring a different perspective, which I think is a good voice to have in a room. So I think, you know, we add value and um, and I'm, and we're also okay to, we're also okay with being humble and admitting when we don't understand something like, a lot of times I'll raise my hand in class and I'll restate what the professor has said in a way that in my mind makes sense. And I'll see a bunch of other people like looking and nodding and saying, oh, okay, got it. Like confirmation that I, we understand what is happening now. And so I think that, um, yeah, it's been wonderful. Um, I mean, I know Michael Lipper is gonna be speaking at the next panel that we have from Ross. And so it's, it's a great community. And they talk about collaboration. That's one of the big pillars at Ross. And um, I think that was for us really spoke to the, the team aspect of the military that we thought we might lose once we left. And so it was another big factor that, that drew us to Ross ultimately and helped us make that decision to go there. Great. Yeah, I think sometimes we veterans don't think or and, and this is active duty so you don't think to look up like, hey, do you have a prospective students day for veterans or do you have a very specific veterans club? Um, which most schools do and that then you can reach into for further support. So as you're researching the schools you want to go to, certainly try and see if they have these special events or uh, presentations or just time to connect with their admissions offices, specifically through this veterans angle. Um, and then Siobhan, how about you as far as your experience at um, McCombs or McComb, sorry. No, you're good. Uh, yeah, very much the same. Um, and the you know kind of how robust the Veterans Club was and how easy it was to reach out to people in the program was a big factor when I was doing my school research um, as well. So, yep, I'm definitely a member of the Vex Club here. It's the Texas Veterans in Business. Um, and then UT has a broader, you know, chapter, Student Veterans Association um, for, you know, all the undergrads and everyone at UT writ large. Um, and they're pretty active as well. They do a lot of volunteer opportunities, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and social get together sort of stuff. Um, this, the school's very supportive, um, same with the instructors, with our classmates. Um, and again, I think I mentioned it earlier, but from a logistics standpoint, uh, UT is very good about helping veterans connect with uh, the VA if you need it or any other sort of social services. like using your GI Bill and walking through that whole kind of Byzantine um, experience. The school itself is very good with that. Um, and so that, you know, shows me that they're invested in making it easy for veterans to be a part of the community. Uh, so it's, it's been a really good experience as well. Awesome. And then Livia, yeah, we'll, we'll close it out with you and your experience at Haas. Sure, thanks. Um, for me, I chose Haas specifically because um, the Veterans Club reached out to, well, once I got in contact with the Veterans Club, they, I think I had like three or four people reach out to me randomly, like just call me. 
to see if I needed anything or any help with the application. So our club is pretty involved with helping other veterans with the application for Haas. And so I suggest that if you're, whatever school you're applying to, if you can't find on their website, the veterans club and how to get a hold of the veterans, um, you know, just call admissions and see if there is one that they can get in, you in touch with. And so for us specifically, um, I think for me, yeah, it was just such a collaborative environment, which was something that I wasn't used to from military people and veterans, right? I think in the military, I was very much used to the competitiveness of things and the cutthroat. Um, and then to have the veterans here at Haas like reach out to me and offer help and genuinely help and take a lot of time, for me, it made me feel like, okay, I'm going to be supported supported at the school, which is definitely the case. And, um, you know, going back to our defining principles of being beyond ourselves specifically, now we just like, what we do is just this vicious cycle of like paying it forward. And so for me, it was important to pay it forward to female veterans. Um, there are only three in my class right now. And so I volunteered to be the VP of admissions for my school, for the Veterans Club. And um, one of the biggest initiatives for our club this year is to increase um, the, the demographics um, of how many women come to our business school. So I think, um, I think that's it. It's just helping each other out um, and then relying on each other for support. We have like a WhatsApp and we all share information and um, help each other out. So that's awesome. I always say veterans find veterans as, at their schools and you're, you're like the living example too of paying it forward to this next cohort of veterans. Um, so that's it. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much to Olivia, Gretchen, Siobhan, and Kristen. This has been awesome. And a special thanks to Steph Kuzak again at Tuck for coordinating all of this. If you as a watcher or an attendee are considering grad school, please sign up for service to school and we will help you consider that next option and get you on the right track. So have a good evening and thank you.